I will talk about synchronous and asynchronous computation in the brain from the neuroscience perspective, but also from the theoretical neuroscience perspective. So I will also show you uh, some, some, some kind of modeling results. And uh, let me just briefly um, summarize. I mean, uh, in, in, uh, usually in computer science, uh, um, uh, synchronous, uh, uh, in a synchronous logic, you basically um, have um, a, rec uh, a periodic clock signal. And the um, kind of the computation is always triggered by the clock signal. And uh, of course, asynchronous uh, computation is kind of more event triggered, uh, is, uh, is basically characterized uh, by the absence of, 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 uh, of a clock signal. That's just very roughly these two different categories. And, um, and now um, let's look in the brain network. And we have already seen here this, this network uh, before. So this is basically. Um, so uh, what you see here is um, the result of an analysis of um, actually cortical cortical connections, and it's actually using the Kokomak database by um, that was actually started by Rolf Kötter, a former colleague of mine, um, and this is actually our um, work by Darmentra, and um, as you can see here, and you cannot really see it, here's all the cortical brain regions. And you can see kind of the bundles of fibers going between these brain regions. And this is kind of the course view of, of, of the um, network that we are dealing uh, here with, of, of the, com the kind of the, the, the computation network. And on the, fine uh, on the fine scale, of course, and this is also something you have already seen here, uh, we have um, the six-layered microcircuit of cortical uh, of, 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 of cortex, and you basically have very rich local connections here within these cells. And Valentin Breitenberg, actually, and, and Almut Schütz, uh, they kind of started uh, um, um, kind of a, a field called quantitative neuroanatomy. So they really started to really count in detail, you know, how many in a, in a, in a let's say, in, a, in the uh, cortex of the mouse, what is the percentage of local uh, excitatory connection versus uh, these uh, f far far ranging fibers and uh, the result of this of this analysis is basically that most of the connections are local and most of the connections are excitatory and so roughly speaking we have here a network which is very different from a deep learning network so we have a very strong local connectivity and it's an excitatory connectivity and um, so the question is now, um, if we look actually in the physiology, um, do we see, is, are there hallmarks of, a, of clock signals? Um, and I mean, a clock signal is a periodic signal. And it's, it's very interesting that actually neural oscillations or neural rhythms were observed, not, I mean, not in the last century, but in the last but one century. In neuroscience, we have this funny situation that we stand on the shoulders of giants which come from the last but one century. And basically, it started in 1875, and then uh, Adolf Beck really um, examined, without having access to, to, to electronic amplifiers, uh, he found basically ongoing rhythms in, in brains and also uh, event-related um, potentials, basically. Um, so, uh, and of course, since then, uh, rhythms have been ob observed all over. They are in the periphery, they are in the retina, uh, they are in, in cortex. Um, they are actually um, on, on many different uh, temporal scales. They are slow and fast rhythms. And um, in the 2000s, it became very popular to think in these rhythms in terms of, of communications between brain regions. And so there's actually this interesting um, concept of the oscillatory hierarchy that kind of talks about nesting of different rhythms um, and mainly for the purpose of communication. And um, but uh, so yeah, there, there are rhythms, but is there one clock rhythm that, that uh, actually governs how, this, how it is computed in this network? No. 
it's, it's, uh, it's a funny situation. So this is actually data from the lab of um, Emery Brown. And he's also an anesthesiologist. And what he actually um, did here is that he put basically a person to sleep with uh, propofol and woke the person up again. And uh, this vertical bar is basically here, uh, the, the look, uh, basically where the consciousness went away and came back again. And you can see that actually under anesthesia, we see this strong and very global rhythm in the EG but not as soon as the brain is in a conscious state. So, so it, it, uh, these strong rhythms are not um, hallmarks of these strong global rhythms that could look like, like clock signals are definitely not hallmarks of, um, of uh, um, the regular operation of the brain. So uh, let me therefore focus now on uh, a, a brain region uh, you have already heard about quite a bit, and this is the hippocampus. And this is actually in Dalmentra's um, diagram. This is just here, this little sliver here. Uh, and here you see a blow up. Um, and, um, and so the hippocampus is um, <clears throat> very important for uh, um, a, a, a kind of laying down episodic memory. So it's a memory region, in particular for, for first contact with the memory content. And it's also very important for navigation. And if you recall from a single cell here in CA1 or CA3, what you actually find is, play, uh, is um, uh, neurons that have place cells, which means that if you actually um, let a rat run through this hallway here and you make a dot of a certain color for one neuron, you will actually see that, for example, here this pink neuron uh, fires only in this part of, of the environment of the animal. And so you have other neurons that then eventually tile the entire environment of the animal. And so that is what you see on the single uh, neuron level. But of course I have chosen this region because there is a very strong um, oscillation in the hippocampus during active um, behavior uh, of the animal. So do, during active voluntary behavior. So if the animal walks through the environment, if the animal uh, presses a lever or does stuff, then you actually see this rather regular rhythm here. It's about 10 per second, 10 hertz. And this is called the theta rhythm. And it's one of the strongest rhythms actually in the brain. You can actually see it if you just take an electrode and go close to that region, you actually will see it. And, um, and so now um, the question is, of course, how does this structure the computation in this brain region? And um, now here's again a, 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 actually a slide you already have seen. And um, what you see here on this side is that there are actually, so this is now basically multi-electrode recording from the hippocampus. So there, there are these colored um, electrodes here. And, um, and the, in the data, there were certain spike trains. So in, on each electrode, there, there are actually certain spike, spikes detected from neurons. And they are basically represented here just as raster, as, as raster crumbs. And um, here they are solved by electrode. And you can see in the animal, and you can see here, this is its theta rhythm. So the animal is walking through the environment here. And you can see here that cells are firing. There are the, the, the green cells, the red cells, and so on. You don't see very much structure. If you look here on the right side, then all of a sudden you see here this structure, which is also emphasized by these el el ellipses um, circled around them. So you see these so-called cell assemblies. So you saw this in Christos's talk yesterday. And so it seems, and so you can also see that actually these bursts of activity in, in different neurons, and they are here spread across the different uh, electrodes. So they are not localized, they are spread out. Um, you can see that there are um, more, more precisely timed, uh, uh, basically, than what you would expect of, of um, so the, the, the animal compared to this very short stretch of time, which is maybe a, a second or so, the animal has not moved very far in the environment. So just by the outside pacing of the environment, you wouldn't expect a timing which is so precise here. And so, therefore, um, it, 
seems here from this picture that indeed the theta rhythm organizes the representations into these cell assemblies in, these, uh, in, in, in the hippocampus. And that you basically can only see this after you reorganize the pattern, uh, basically the spike trains from here to here. And what actually Ken Harris, who produced this data, and, or actually who analyzed the data in 2003, he actually took it out of the trash bin of the, of the Busaki lab, um, what he found is actually, um, so, so what he used here to resolving the data is kind of an algorithm that compares the similarity in time of the different spike trains. Um, so now, what kind of computation could you locally do with this? And so this is actually here um, the result of a, a simulation uh, model that we uh, did a long time ago that uh, Thomas Venikels uh, around 2000. And so these are basically a bunch of, of, uh, of, of conductance space neurons, two compartment neurons. And basically we, we kind of stored local cell assemblies in, these, uh, in the network. So, so basically in the, synapt in the synaptic structure there are now certain patterns that are like, like, like attractors. And what you can see here that in each of the, of the, of the oscillation cycles, we, uh, here you can see it very clearly. So there are here these a little bit earlier coming neurons. And they are stimulated by the outside. And then you can see the, 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 the other five here coming on. And this is now the network effect. So you can see that these oscillations could actually organize content address, uh, addressed memory recall uh, cycle per cycle. And so this is basically, so this is now all saying that, you know, locally, these rhythms could actually organize and, and even actually synchronize certain computations and kind of, of, of form representations that are more synchronized in time than what you would expect, for example, by the changes in the outside in the sensory signals. And it has been shown by physiologists like uh, Randy Bruno and so on that, that, that actually this focusing in time uh, could be very important to be actually for, 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 for actually uh, synaptic input to, uh, inputs to be heard in a subsequent area. Because, and here I come back to what I said earlier, because most of the, of the connections that a neuron actually has in a cortical area is recurrent connectivity. So it's not so clear, uh, you know, how, how an LGN input 2v1 can be heard is not as clear as you would believe if you see the textbook picture. Because somehow V1 has to figure out that among all these recurrent inputs, there is actually some input from the input now which is important, if, if, an input is, if a sensory input is important. So <clears throat> now let me kind of go on to another situation. And this is now basically uh, going beyond uh, synchronous computing. Um, so this now shows um, actually uh, just a cartoon of an idea that actually Pascal Fries put forward, which is more um, about, it's an idea how actually routing um, could be performed in the brain and, and routing uh, in, in, in the sense that, that basically uh, functional networks are built. So a brain area by itself can do almost nothing. It's always basically the, the, the functional network for a certain task that needs to collaborate in order to perform a function. So how to basically set up a functional network almost on the fly is very important as we switch from one task to the ne next. And so his idea was, um, so we have here three brain areas. These are now entire brain areas, not neurons, A, B, and C. And A and B are, uh, have an oscillation which is uh, coherent in phase. So the phases are almost the same. And C is out of phase. And his idea was now that often these, these rhythms, they also go al along, they basically also modulate the excitability of neurons locally. And so his point is that these two guys are in a good position to talk to each other because actually their signals arrive on the, on the other side uh, when actually there's a maximum of excitability and therefore elicit spikes here. Whereas uh, B and C have a hard time to, to communicate. And this is called the communication through coherence uh, uh, hypothesis that actually Pascal has uh, quite some, produced some data to actually support. Now, 
Okay, so now this is now, of course, um, a way how actually you already need, need kind of an asynchronous circuit to, to actually set up these functional networks by actually decoupling some networks and put, putting them, uh, decoupling some, some, some regions and putting them out of phase of the other. Um, but the picture becomes even more complicated if you look at um, conduction delays. So this is actually, this is an old graph, the old, it's not, yeah, it's, it, this is basically from Harvey Swadlow's work, and this shows you here, so on the x-axis is actually in milliseconds delays, conduction delays, measured by androm, uh, antidromic uh, stimulation um, over basically it's just a histogram. So how often he just, um, um, in many cell pairs, he measured the conduction delay, and this is actually, I think, through the callosum. So this is not a, a local connection. This is really a kind of a long-range connection in cortex. And what he finds here, well, there's a peak maybe here around seven milliseconds, but you have a pretty, pretty a heavy tail here of very, very slow fibers. And, um, and it is not clear that uh, if two neurons fire together, that actually their, their, their signals arrive at some neurons they synapse to at the same time, given that you have this dispersion here of conductions. And, um, and therefore, um, uh, Eugene Itzikiewicz and also Busaki put forward that maybe what really counts is not synchronous firing, but synchronous arriving of, of, of basically synaptic inputs. And uh, Itzikiewicz calls this polysynchrony, and actually Busaki calls these synapsemblies. So it could be that under, at, at least for uh, if long range con connections are involved, that it's not just about, a, a, you know, a, a, synchronous firing, but it's more about actually synchronous arrival of spikes. And this could actually be for the physiology, it's just a quite different picture. Um, so we actually studied a little bit how if you, if you actually um, put in these, uh, this is just the same picture here, Harvey Swadlow's uh, distribution of conduction delays in a, in a simulated neural network, again, conductance-based neurons, uh, and let's say you have here two uh, um, brain areas uh, um, that have an excitatory, inhibitory, and two inhibitory um, uh, pools here. And so here in the middle are the long-range connections. So these are the connections uh, that actually have these delays. And um, <clears throat> if you just simulate such a network, then actually you, you find that oscillations, at least in the gamma range, which is the higher frequency range, 52 to 70 hertz or so, that if, if um, uh, that, that, that what you see is you don't see in-phase synchrony between these two regions because the delays are just on a very too long. And, but what we could show is actually that um, if, if you now assume that there's STDP learning rules, that then very quickly you, could, you can actually establish a zero-phase synchrony between these two regions. And so, um, but this is definitely, um, uh, conduction delays um, can, at, at least for long-range connections, definitely cannot be um, uh, neglected if you think about how actually the um, communication takes place in, in, the, in the brain network. So now let me come back to the, um, to the hippocampus. So um, in the hippocampus, there are these place fields. So there are two neurons, blue and red, and uh, they are in here are their spike trains. And you can see that uh, the animal walks here from red to blue, and red fires here, blue starts to fire here. But if you now actually uh, draw here, and this is, uh, um, this is just a, um, a, a cartoon, if you draw here the theta rhythm, and you and you note here the, the relative phase of, of, let's say, the red spikes and the theta rhythm, you actually find that they actually advance in phase as you go from heel to heel. It's just maybe a little bit uh, small effect here, but, but basically this relative phase turns out to tell you something of where in the blaze field the animal is, and that's called phase possession, was actually uh, discovered by O'Keefe and, and Retsche. And, um, and so here we have now a situation where actually the, um, this relative phase becomes important. 
And um, there's also models that actually uh, showed. As a, so that was a very simple model actually by, by John Hopfield in, in 1995. And he showed basically that if you have actually, a, let's say, a sensory input, which is just rate coded here, high rates here, less, less so here, higher rates here again. And now you have actually an oscillating neural network where, again, uh, the oscillation determines how excitable a neuron is. Then, of course, you will see that the, the strongest excited neurons fire first. And that basically in the latency of these spikes, you have basically an encoding of the strength of the sensory input. And um, <clears throat> so this could, could be a way how actually now the, um, this clock, this local clock signal does actually more than just um, um, organizing the timing and maybe the representation of cell assemblies, but could really have a function here in, for example, transforming a, a rate code into a latency code and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but of course, um, for a long time, people believed that actually this rhythm that you see here um, is the same so that it's the same everywhere in the hippocampus. And that, of course, would then make make it easy to, to, to think about such schemes of what actually this oscillation could do for you computationally. However, in actually 2009, uh, Tanus Siapas' uh, lab actually showed that in the hippocampus, uh, the theta rhythm, which is really one of the strongest rhythm in, in the brains, uh, uh, in the brain, is actually not, uh, is, is, is has not the same phase independent of space. So this is, this shows uh, one depiction of the hippocampus where this is the spatial, the, the septal uh, temporal axis. Don't worry about this right now, but basically he, um, this is actually a, a, um, a figure from a follow-up paper from the Busaki lab, but they, they placed electrodes <laughs> there and basically measured here the, um, so on the x-axis, you have the relative distance here from this zero point along the, the septotemporal axis. So this is just this axis here, is on the x-axis here. And on the y-axis is basically the phase angle. And so you basically can see that as you wander along this axis, the phase angle just goes up by basically 180 degrees. And so this means that um, actually this um, Phase angle is, uh, yeah, is, 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 a, is a function of, of space. And if you look over, uh, at it um, in time, you actually see this. And this is basically where a project with actually Gautam Agarwal started, a former postdoc in my lab. So we basically asked the question, OK, um, so this is, so you see basically, um, here, this is the anatomy of the hippoca of the of, of CA1, and you basically we had eight an eight by eight electrode array, and this is now again Busaki lab data. An eight by eight electrode array was here implanted, and so basically every point here on this plane, it's an eight by eight uh, grid, um, and this is basically just um, um, depicts uh, the, 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 the signal strength, uh, strength as a function of time. And this is, again goes, goes 10 per second. And so basically what we asked uh, with, with GoTam was basically, well, um, we know that there is relative place information uh, encoded if you know the spikes and you, you, you know the relative uh, um, uh, phase uh, to, the, to, to the theta rhythm. But can we actually, if we have a spatial temporal structure of this uh, hippocampal wave, can we decode the behavior of the animal? Can we decode where the animal is in, in the environment? <laughs> And this is kind of, a, in, in the hippocampus, is the decoding question difficult because there is no topography. So, so nearby blaze cells are not nearby in the hippocampus. So therefore, these are very mixed signals, unlike to V1 and A1, where often even if you measure on one electrode and you do not sort spikes, you, you get a very nice preference in, in orientation angle or in the feature. Um, we were, though, so, uh, relatively optimistic uh, based on some actually uh, theory work that we did on actually compressed sensing, which can basically be applied to the situation that you um, record with a relatively small number of electrodes in the tissue with a relatively large number of neurons. 
And then, of course, the, the second um, obstacle to decoding the wave is basically that um, there is an intrinsic dynamics. There is this rolling wave through the tissue, which by itself is not uh, correlated with the behavior and therefore certainly not helpful for decoding. And for that, actually, it helped that uh, the, the senior authors <laughs> of this study, Gurian and myself, we, we kind of grew up building transmitters. And so we were very familiar with concepts of, of, of actually modulation and, and demodulation. And so basically what we did is we um, took, um, so this is just um, the raw signal. So here are the channels, and uh, this is time. And so basically what we did is we, 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 we took the, the first principal component of this spatial temporal uh, signal structure and, and, uh, and declared this as the carrier. And then basically did a phase demodulation using that carrier. And the result of the demodulation is here. And you see this is already a much slower signal, uh, much more um, in line with the behavioral time scale actually of the animal. And what you see already here is these are now uh, trial repeats over many runs of the animal to, uh, to the right and to the left. And you see there is some resulting structure in the trial of Verich, which already is very encouraging of, um, for decoding. And so I have to, to uh, um, speed up. But anyway, so we basically could decode. This is basically uh, using the spikes. Uh, um, recorded from the same electrodes for decoding where the animal is, and here it runs left and right. And this is just the LFP structure. And so you can see here in this green trace that the LFP structure is as good as, as what you get with the spikes. And more interesting, if you combine the two things, you actually get, get, get an improvement. And um, we also applied unsupervised learning directly to these LFP signals, and we kind of found um, actually uh, the, the independent components of this are actually, so these are now trial repeats on, on the y-axis and again and, and, and location on the, on the, on the x-axis here. And you basically see each of these colors correspond to a, to a component of the LFP um, uh, signal. Uh, which was highly selective to one location in the animal. And we have a complete set tiling the entire uh, environment. It is just using unsupervised learning. And in the electrode space, all these components are extremely um, distributed across all the electrodes. So that's very different from a neural signal, from what you would see if you would, if you would do that uh, independent component analysis actually on the high frequency spectrum that you use for spike sorting. So, um, and just this uh, shows you basically that this works also in more complicated environments. Here, these different colors correspond to different um, blaze components extracted by this unsupervised learning. So to sum up, um, basically what I've, I've shown you that uh, basically the physiology and also the abundance of excitatory recurrent circuitry suggests that neural rhythms are a part of the brain dynamics and function. Oscillations ongoing or induced can shape cell assemblies, support learning, and set up large-scale functional networks. That's the more traditional stuff. Uh, the new data he here basically um, um, uh, 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 kind of suggested that the oscillations often carry specific task uh, information. So it's not just a clock signal. It's also not just a signal about the global state of the brain. But it is a signal that you actually can for example, used to decode where the animal is at every point in time. So therefore, the suggestion is that the local field recordings simultaneous to spiking activity are important and can really help to understand how sub-threshold sub population dynamics and spikes interact to produce computation. And so um, I, I think right now the field of uh, neuroscience is very spike focused. So everyone wants to, to, to sort spike and look at spikes. One should not throw away all these signals that are in the low frequencies and that you can extract from the same electrodes that you stick into to decode spikes. And um, currently, um, Neither brain theories nor neuromorphic models provide an insight about this interplay between actually uh, spikes and these continuous population subthreshold uh, events that we see in the LFPs. And I think that is uh, certainly not, a, a, is certainly a, would be a very interesting uh, direction to actually get new ideas for neuromorphic computing. Thanks a lot for your attention.
Uh, time for a quick question while Rajit sets up. Say that brain theories have nothing about um, what LFPs are or they mean. I mean, it's, uh, it's it's been it's been pretty mainstream that they're you know this is the the sum or the weighted sum of distributed local driver currents um, with filtering and blah 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 in details. But um, I, why isn't that counting as brain theory respecting what LFPs are and what they mean? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I, absolutely, there are, of course, a lot of theories what these LFPs, you know, how there, there is work, uh, some work on how these LFPs are composed and so on, but still I think there is not much work that really relates. So, for example, how does spike-based spike computing look in the presence of this, these structures? I think there is not much work. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to learn if you, if you have some work, but I think right now we don't have a good idea how, how these, this, I, I would say these, these analog processes, uh, these analog structures of the LFPs, they, they fit like a, a, a jig puzzle to the spiking, to the structure in the spikes. And we should understand this interaction between both, and I, th I still th I think there is not much theory that tells us how we could use that for computation, uh, in, in, in particular, uh, including the rhythms. So, so do you think of the fields per se as being, as being contributive to, um, or just as evidence of synchronous activity among you know, regional neurons, or is that a longer question that we should put off? Let's take it offline. <laughs> 